So I'm delighted to be here this evening to talk to you about sleep and the importance of sleep. Um, I think in today's society where we have less and less time to sleep and with more and more demands being placed on us, that it's becoming more difficult for us to get enough time to get an adequate amount of sleep. Um, we hear a lot today about how we have to um, have a good diet and we have to have good exercise in order to maintain our mental health or our physical health. But in fact, sleep is vital to our well-being. It's a chance for our bodies to kind of rejuvenate, to process the day's events from yesterday. Um, and it's a chance to get ready for the day ahead. And it's actually vital in many aspects of our physical and mental well-being, which we'll touch on just a few slides down the road. Um, it's not the passive state that many people once considered it to be. It's known now that it's a highly active process during which the day's events are processed. So again, a couple of slides down, we'll talk about what is it in terms of the cycle of sleep? So how much sleep do we need? And um, in what kind of quantity do we need to get that sleep as well? OK, so in terms of quality versus quantity. Um, so. The purpose of today's lecture is not really to look at any particular sleep disorder, although I'm sure there are people out there who have um, either a diagnosis of a sleep disorder um, or consider themselves to have a sleep disorder. So some of those would be the likes of insomnia or sleep apnea um, and narcolepsy, those kind of things that you hear about in the media. The purpose of today's lecture is really to look at the practical, everyday things that we can do as individuals that can help improve our sleep. And I suppose this ties a little bit into what Leslie was saying about my passion for patients and the best care. Like in today's day and age where we're delivering mental health care to such a variety of people, it's important that we, you know, empower people to look after their own mental health. What is it the steps that you can take as a person that may help to improve your sleep? Um, and that's before you ever have to go to find some specialist to treat you. So that's really what today's lecture is about. It's about empowering you as people or as people who know individuals who have sleep problems or sleep difficulties to actually manage that sleep difficulty to the best of your ability and hopefully to pr um, improve that sleep difficulty. So we are going to look at the impact of sleep loss and anybody who's had difficulties or experienced difficulties in sleeping would probably be able to nod along to a couple of these. Um, but also you might be surprised to find how the sleep loss can actually impact both your physical and mental health. Um, we'll also look at the recommended hours of sleep across the lifespan. Um, how is sleep controlled? And we're not going to dwell too much on how sleep is controlled because the purpose of this lecture is not to get technical. But what the reason I've put that in there is so that we can give you an idea as to what drives us as people to sleep and how we can best support those drives. Okay, um, and that's what a lot of the practical tips that we will look at are focused on supporting those internal drives that every single one of us has, but it's just about getting them back into a rhythm. And some of the practical tips will be able to help you get those drives back into a rhythm. Um, and the last thing we're going to do is we're actually going to partake in a progressive muscle relaxation. So you hear a lot of people talk about how relaxation can help you sleep. And we focused this evening on progressive muscle relaxation because it's a very easy tool to use. There's not a lot of thinking involved in that tool. Um, but also, I suppose, because of the size of the, the hall and the fact that we weren't sure who'd be standing or sitting, that it's a tool that can be used very, very easily, okay? Um, I just caution people in terms of using it. It's going to look at different muscle groups throughout your body, so you'll look at tightening and relaxing s several different muscle groups. And as you're doing that, just be careful if you have any kind of stresses or strains in those muscle groups so that you don't overextend yourself. So either do the, the relaxation exercise a little bit gentler or miss out on certain areas is if you have any difficulties. So the impact of sleep loss. So there are several ways in which sleep can affect us. Um, and one of those is motor and cognitive performance. 
So sleep, some studies have shown that sleep deprivation for about 19 hours, so where participants didn't get to sleep for 19 hours, they actually showed cognitive and motor performance that was worse than those who were legally intoxicated. Um, we've also seen studies that show us how individuals are at test times in terms of simple reactions. So if they were deprived over a number of days, so participants were asked to sleep 4.5 hours of sleep a night and over a number of days, and they actually scored worse worse than things like simple reaction tests, so judgment tests, um, recall tests, and performance. Okay, so it, it very significantly impacts upon your cognition and motor performance. Um, mood. So it's well documented within um, evidence that a lack of sleep can affect your mood. And most of us know if we've missed out on a couple of hours or of sleep a night, we're kind of a little bit groggy and grouchy and, you know, we just don't feel ourselves throughout the day. But if you multiply that by missing out on a couple of hours sleep every night for a number of nights, you can imagine how that might affect your mood. And some studies have shown where participants were asked to sleep four hours a night um, over the course of a week that they reported more sadness, more anxiety, more anger, um, and generally feeling mentally exhausted by the end of that week. But once they were allowed to return their sleep to a normal or expected amount of sleep, that improved very rapidly. Um, probably one of the things that we don't realise sleep impacts upon most is our hormones and our metabolism. Um, so at night time, when you're sleeping, your body is responsible for releasing hormones and helping your metabolism to get up and going. Um, and without it, we can find that we have an increased risk to things like obesity and diabetes. Um, so studies have shown how our bodies release growth hormone throughout the night, okay? And we all think, God, growth hormone, okay, for the kids, we better get them to bed because, you know, they need to grow. But actually, growth hormone will regulate your, your, fat, your body fat and your muscle mass, okay? So it helps in terms of balancing that, and it also helps in terms of appetite. So if you're sleeping less at night time, you will find that it can affect your... Um, weight levels and also your appetite throughout the day. Um, and the other thing is diabetes. So recently one study has actually shown that young healthy adults, um, men, were asked, were sleep deprived for a number of days um, across a week. Again, they were asked to sleep four hours a night for that week. And at the end of that week, they were tested for their metabolism of sugar. Okay. And it actually decreased to a point that was pre-diabetic. Okay. So sleep probably has a role to play in terms of diabetes and the management of that as well. Um, the immune system. So many of us know when we're not feeling very well, what we do is we crawl in under the sheets, okay? And that's probably our body's way of trying to help our immune system to get up and going and give it a kickstart. Um, there's been a study recently that showed where healthy adults were given a flu vaccine, okay? And those adults that were sleep deprived actually didn't react to that flu vaccine as well as the others. So they didn't have the same immunity to the flu as the other adults who actually had an adequate amount of sleep. Um, so you can see there that that would be affecting how you, your immune system works. Um, and lastly, it's been shown to affect cardiovascular system as well. So studies have shown that people who don't have an adequate amount of sleep, they have increased blood pressure, they have a greater risk of stroke heart or and heart attack. Okay, so many, many reasons for us all to be focusing on our sleep. And I suppose that's the reason today we've, we've come to talk about how vital sleep is to us. It's really key to our well-being and we need to prioritise that sleep every night. Okay? And so for some of us that may mean that some jobs don't get done throughout the day. It may mean the extra load of laundry stays in the washing machine or that work email that we had planned on sending at about half nine, ten o'clock at night remains undone to the following morning. But hopefully the impact of that would be that the following morning you have more energy to follow up on those tasks. So this here is a slide from the National Sleep Foundation. Okay. And they've released it, I think it was 2015 they released this slide, and it basically shows across the lifespan how much sleep we all need. So I guess most of us would be familiar with the fact 
that babies or newborns need a lot, a lot of sleep. Okay, they generally sleep somewhere between 14 to 17 hours a night. Um, But as you progress throughout the lifespan, that actually decreases. Um, So if you come as far as the adult, which is 26 to 64 years, you're looking at about seven to nine hours a night. And for anybody who is an older adult, um, so over the age of 65, you're looking at about seven to eight hours a night. Okay, so um, these are recommendations and you will see above and below, you'll see that there are other numbers so below say the adults there's six and above it is ten and I guess really what that's hitting at is that we're all individuals that not one thing is not going to work for every single person so some of us may feel that actually at about six hours we function really really well we don't have any difficulties throughout the day there's no tiredness there's no grogginess and we don't have any impact upon say our mood or our cognitive or motor abilities throughout the day and if you find that that's the case then six hours suits you fine Okay, um, but if it doesn't and you do find you're having some impacts upon your mental or physical health, then move that up a little bit. It might be enough to move it up by an hour. It might be that you have to move it up to the maximum of 10 hours. Okay, so it's just about finding what works well for you. Sorry. So what controls sleep? Um, This slide is going to be very brief for people, okay? And it's just to give you an idea of what is it uh, that we need in terms to promote these internal systems of ourselves. So the sleep drive, which is the green one up here in the middle, okay, or up here at the top, sorry. Um, This is a homeostatic drive. So this gradually builds throughout the day. It's the release of hormones. So one of those would be adenosine, okay? Adenosine helps you get sleepy. And as you go about your business throughout the day, your body gradually releases adenosine. But there are certain things that we do that impact upon the release of some of those hormones. So one of them would be caffeine. So caffeine and adenosine, caffeine is known to interrupt the receptors for adenosine, which means that actually your sleep drive can't gradually build throughout the day so you're stopping it from working okay and the other one is melatonin okay so melatonin is produced in the darkness okay at night time and that promotes us to be very sleepy at night but if we're using things like electronic devices and televisions till maybe two or three o'clock in the morning then we're actually reducing our body's ability to produce melatonin and the second drive we have here is the blue um, wave at the bottom, okay? And this is called your alerting signal, or some people will know it as your circadian rhythm. So what that is, is it's generally set by external cues. And in people, the strongest external cue to regulating our circadian rhythm is actually light. So how much light you're exposed to. So you can see generally from about 6 a.m. it starts to rise and it kind of reaches its peak around 9 p.m. and then starts to drop off rather rapidly after that. But if we go on exposing ourselves to natural or unnatural light after that time, then we're actually confusing our circadian rhythm. So the purpose of of this is to try and get us to think about the fact that our body has this rhythm and how do we support this rhythm into performing at its best, okay? The sleep cycle. So there are five stages within the sleep cycle. And again, this is not something that I want to get too technical about, okay? But it's just to let people know that sometimes we all go to bed and we get the recommended amount of sleep. We probably get seven to nine hours and we wake up feeling as if we haven't been in bed at all. Um, And some of that can be due to the fact that we're not getting through the sleep cycle in its totality. So it lasts about 90 to 20 minutes, okay? So stage one is the transition between sleep and wakefulness. So this is where you're starting to kind of drop off to sleep. Your blood pressure and your pulse are starting to kind of lower at this point. Stage two is a light period of sleep. So your temperature drops a little bit during this stage. And again, your blood pressure and pulse, they start to drop a little and you actually have, you're no longer really conscious of what's going on around you. Stage three and four I'll do together, okay? So this is where deep sleep begins and then very deep sleep. So both of these stages you will find (laughs) that your pulse and your blood pressure, they're They've dropped a good bit, okay? You're very kind of relaxed in your sleep. Your brain waves are actually very slow at this point. Um, And if you were woken during either stage three or stage four, you'd find that you're very groggy. You might feel like you've been out for a few and you need to kind of wake up from that. Um, So those are the deepest stages of sleep.
And then stage five is what we call as rapid eye movement sleep. And, and many of people have kind of heard these terms used before. So this is the most active period of sleep. This is where we do a lot of our dreaming. And actually our muscles are kind of immobilized during this sleep this stage of sleep, but our eyes are moving rapidly. Um, and we need to get through each of these five stages of sleep in order to feel that we've had a restful night's sleep. And some things can impinge upon us doing that. So for example, alcohol is a common cause of not getting through these five stages. There's this kind of idea that if we have a glass of whiskey or a glass of wine before we go to bed, that might promote sleep within us. And you may very well find that it helps you fall asleep, but it may actually disturb the stages of sleep you get through. So you wake up feeling as if you haven't slept. Another common thing would be low grade kind of back pain where it's not enough to wake you up, but it's enough to sort of throw out your five stages of sleep. So it's important to just keep that in your mind if you are sleeping the recommended amount and still not feeling as if you're getting enough sleep. So the purpose of this lecture, how to sleep better, and I guess one of the recommendations I would put out there to people who are having difficulty currently sleeping is get yourself a pen and paper and keep a diary for about two weeks. Keep an idea of what these good sleep hygiene habits are, but also don't change anything. Have a look at what it is you're doing today and for the next 14 days that may be causing you to not get enough sleep. So that might give you an indication of which one of these practical tips will work best for you. Um, and if you're here because you know somebody who's um, having a sleep difficulty, that's probably a very useful tip to give them because it, it allows them to have a look at what they're doing and empowers them to maybe change some of the sleep practices that they have. So support your internal clock. So this is the circadian rhythm that we were talking about. Stick to a consistent schedule, even on the weekends, the holidays, and the days off, which I know is difficult for people. You know, you feel that if you're sleeping in during the day, you're actually paying off some of your sleep death particularly if you didn't sleep well at night time. But actually what you're doing is throwing your internal rhythm out a little bit. It doesn't know, should it be awake or should it be asleep? There's no consistency for it. Um, and avoid sleeping in. So what you find is if there's a big difference between the weekends and the weekdays in terms of what time you're getting up at, then you're actually going to have some jet lag kind of symptoms because your circadian rhythm is really confused about when you should be in bed and when you should get up. Um, if you've had a really late night and you really need those extra few hours of sleep, it's actually better for your rhythm if you get up in the morning and go back to bed in the afternoon for a couple of hours sleep um, rather than staying in bed for that morning. Limit daytime napping. So there's lots of information out there at the moment that is advocating napping. But if you're having a sleep difficulty and you either can't get to sleep at night time or you're waking up several times throughout the night, it could be that you're paying off some of that sleep throughout the day. So if you have a number of sleeping naps throughout the day, then you don't need as much sleep throughout the night. So if you can either avoid napping during the day or limit it to about 15 to 20 minutes, you might find that that starts to improve your sleep at night time. So fight the after-dinner fatigue. So this is the one we're all very familiar with. So we've had a nice feed after a hard day's work and we sit down for a few minutes. And hey presto, it's three hours later before we're woken up. Um, and that actually means that we've disturbed our internal rhythm where, where it's still bright outside, but we're giving it the message that it should be sleeping. So it's finding difficulty in balancing itself. And creating a bedtime ritual. So this is about, again, working your way towards bed, letting your internal clock know that these are the things I do every night before I get into bed. There's a consistency, there's a routine. And some of that might be as simple as doing small preparations for the day ahead. So non kind of stimulating activities that you can do without causing yourself too much stress or anxiety. Um, activities such as maybe reading a book, listening to some music. Okay, so those kind of non stimulating activities that set your system up for it's nearly bedtime and I'll, we'll be there soon. Control your exposure to light. Um, so 
like I was saying, this again is about your circadian rhythm. So the strongest cues for your circadian rhythm is actually how much light you get. Um, so during the daytime, get some sun in the morning. Open the blinds when you get up in the morning. Let that natural light in. Wake up your circadian rhythm. Say, hey, it's time to get going. It's time to really, you know, this is wake time. So we're promoting those wakeful, stimulating kind of um, feelings. Spend some time outside each day. So by actually exposing yourself to natural light you can promote that wakeful side and let as much li natural light in as possible so many of us work in this day and age in areas that are office spaces that perhaps don't have a lot of natural light but you know open those blinds and let in as much as you possibly can maybe during work breaks take five minutes outside to expose yourself to natural light and ensure that you're waking your circadian rhythm up and then of course the opposite is true of nighttime so one of the big culprits we have at the moment are electronic devices. Um, and look, I'm guilty of it myself, off to bed to check Facebook six times before I ever go to sleep, as if anything has changed. Um, but it really, if you're experiencing de sleep difficulties, I suppose if that's not causing you any problems, then there's no need to change it. But if it is causing you problems, or it could be contributing to your problems, think about putting those devices away probably an hour before you go to sleep at night time. Um, and I know that's difficult, but it could be putting them in a drawer and, and, and drawing a line on it and saying, look, I need to do this for myself. I need to just put it away. It'll still be there in the morning. Um, say no to late night television. So again, it's the harsh blue lights that are emitted from these devices. They trick our circadian rhythm into thinking that they're being exposed to daylight. Um, but also late night television, <laughs> particularly with the um, invention of things like Netflix, where we actually can watch all the series in one go. So you just think, I'll just, I'll just do one more half an hour or just another um, episode. You know, it's very easy to get sucked into watching something. And, for, like, and then it's one o'clock or two o'clock before you realize it. And a dark room is best. So if you can limit the amount of light getting into your room, and that comes from things like street lights as well. So... Draw down the curtains, and if that's not enough to block out the street lights, then actually try some blackout blinds. They might help to bring down that light for you and stimulate your um, natural rhythms. And keep the lights low if you get up. So my other half's disaster for this one. When he gets up in the night, all the lights go on, like there's no one else in the house. But actually what that's doing to you is... You know, it's stimulating you into thinking, it's time to be awake. I'm being exposed to some kind of light. So I actually, I should be up and I should be out of the bed. So if you have to get up to go to the bathroom or, you know, to do something throughout the night, maybe it's you need to get up for a snack. If there are low lights that you can put around the place that you can tap onto a low level, maybe that might help you be able to get back into sleep and go back to bed. Pay attention to what you eat and drink. So this isn't just about having a healthy, nutritious diet, um, which are one of the factors that will help you kind of sleep. What it's about is don't go to bed too hungry or too full. And you may have to play around with this a little bit, okay? Because for some people, when they have something to eat before they go to bed, they find that they have indigestion and that will keep them up throughout the night. And for other people, if they don't have something to sleep before they go to, to eat, sorry, before they go to sleep, then what you're gonna find is they wake up hungry throughout the night. So just play around a little bit with what's good for you. It may be that you have to change your snacking habits as well on the way to bed. Limit how much you drink before you go to bed. And this is to do with your nighttime trips to the bathroom, okay? So after about 6, 7 p.m., you're going to try and bring that down to virtually nothing. The same as we would do for our young children who are potty training and we don't want them to have to get up throughout the night. So um, for yourself, if you find that actually having to get up and go to the bathroom a number of times throughout the night causes you to wake, then have a look at this one. Put down on caffeine, and I suppose we all know about caffeine and the effects that it has on us and the fact that it's a stimulant. <coughs> but what cutting down on caffeine can mean is actually looking at other food content and what is in the other foods we eat, such as chocolate. Okay, so there's actually caffeine in chocolate. And if you are consuming your bar of chocolate instead of your cup of coffee before you go to bed, you could be affecting your sleep pattern. So like I said, the adenosine kind of that you needed to have sleep is actually blocked by caffeine. And even small amounts of caffeine can do that. So have a look at your food labels and make sure that there's nothing in them that could prevent you from sleeping. 
Alcohol, we've touched on already. So again, it won't it will probably help you to get to sleep, but it will not promote a good restful night's sleep. You'll find that you don't get through all the, um, the different stages of sleep and you wake up feeling as if you haven't been rested. And then nicotine. So I think this sometimes comes as a surprise to people. A lot of smokers will have their last cigarette just before they get into bed at night time. Okay? And actually nicotine is a stimulant. So what it's doing is it's stimulating you to be awake and to get going. Um, and today, it, at least today I heard from one smoker that actually when they gave up smoking, they slept like a log. So, and they never realized that smoking had any effect, impact upon their sleeping at all. Include physical activity. So regular physical activity can promote better sleep. It will help you fall asleep and enjoy a deeper sleep. It also helps you to feel less sleepy throughout the day. However, there is a caveat to that, okay? The timing of regular active physical activity is really important because it will increase your blood pressure, it will increase your heart rate, it will get your endorphins going, and what that's meant to do is actually wake you up. So if you're engaging in vigorous activity, I would look at doing that at least three hours before you make it to bed, okay? But for some people, it can actually be six hours before your system returns to an adequate level of temperature that will help you sleep throughout the night. So most of us sleep when we're slightly cool, um, but for some people, it takes about six hours to return to that level of temperature. So if you find that you're exercising three hours before bed, but you're still, and you're doing all the other things right, but you're still not sleeping, it might be worth pushing that back even half an hour at a time to see if that impacts upon how you're sleeping. And then low impact exercises can actually help to promote sleep. So these are things like yoga, like baby stretches, do you know what I mean? Nothing, that no jumping around, no getting your heart rate up and increasing it, but nice gentle stuff that will help you get towards sleep. And you could actually include this um, in your toolbox for creating a good night's sleep. So creating a relaxing bedroom. So save your bed for sleep and sex. So what we're saying here is that you are using your room for what, it, like the, to keep out the business aspects of your life, I suppose, that you're promoting your natural rhythms into thinking, well, when I'm in this room, this is where I sleep. This is, and this is where I do it best. You know what I mean? So it's about promoting a general ritual and bedtime that helps both of your rhythms to get going. Um, block the clock. So for many of us, we have either a clock on our bedside table, or I have one that signs shines up onto the roof, okay? Um, but if you're waking throughout the night, it can be very anxiety provoking to see that you're awake five minutes later and now you've been awake for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So by continuously looking at that clock, what you're actually doing is you're getting your anxieties up and going, which may actually be preventing you from getting an adequate amount of sleep. Keep the noise down. So this sounds very, very simple, um, but things like the leaky faucet, that you can just hear drip, drip, drip at night. It's driving you insane, okay? And then they are going to kind of interrupt you when you're at your lighter stages of sleep and may prevent you from getting into your deeper stages of sleep. Um, so if you can, block it out, earplugs, okay? But if you can't, a good tip is in terms of white noise, okay? So you sometimes see it used for the babies. There's plenty of apps out there, although you shouldn't be using your smartphones or devices. But if you want to put your white noise in and then put it into some kind of cupboard where you can't see the glow from that um, device, then that might help. Also, there's also white noise machines you can get, or there are a fan will do the exact same thing. So it just creates a low grade noise that generally helps to promote sleep and block out some of the other annoying noises that are out there. Um, set the right temperature. So we sleep best at around 18 degrees, okay? So slightly cooler than you would think. Um, so if you can set that temperature down to about 18, then that might help promote a good night's um, sleep for you. And then back pain. Like I explained earlier, low-grade back pain might not wake you up throughout the night, but it actually may prevent you from getting through the full cycles of sleep. Um, so things that you might be able to do for that are... You know, just check, is your pillow too big? Is it causing your neck to be out of alignment with the rest of your body? Um, sometimes if you pop a pillow between your knees and your lower legs, that can help you align your hips, which might just take enough pressure off the back or off your back to allow you to get through those um, five cycles or stages of sleep. 
Manage your stress. Um, so this is a big one in terms of our inability to sleep. Sometimes people will say, well, I'm so stressed, I can't stop thinking about, or I don't know how to manage. Um, and I suppose in today's society where there's more and more pressure put on people, this can be a factor that will stop you from sleeping well. Um, consider ways in which you might manage your stress. So one of those would be creating a toolbox of relaxing bedtime rea or rituals okay, that can help you unwind. So relaxation might be one of those. Reading um, a non-stimulating kind of activity could be another good one. Um, things like relaxing music, um, soft kind of gentle exercises. They are all good toolboxes that you can, tools that you can use to help you wind down from any worries that were bothering you. Um, manage your thoughts. So this is about getting, I suppose, perspective on your thoughts and whether or not you can delay that worrying until the following morning or is that worry something that you really, you know, that's really actually enough to keep you awake at night time. Um, and if you can't manage your own thoughts, I suppose that might be a chance where you need to look at whether or not you need further help in terms of managing those thoughts. And I suppose next week we do have a public le lecture on managing worries. So if you find that, you know, anxiety is the one thing that's stopping you from sleeping. And Dr. Keith Gaynor next week might be able to give you some more, um, some better tips that you might be able to put in play as well for that. Discard your thoughts. So if your anxieties at night time are really causing you to wake up, it has been shown that if you write these thoughts down and actually throw them away, all right, it can help you just say, well, for tonight I've thrown them away or I've thrown them in the fire so I can put them away for just tonight. Um, and practice a relaxation technique. So I've spoke about this already and you're going to get a chance to do that now in a couple of minutes. And getting back to sleep. So this is a very common complaint for peop people um, that they wake up at night time and they actually can't get back to sleep. Um, it's perfectly normal for us to wake up. The important thing is not to fret about it when you do wake up. So the fact that you might worry about having to get back to sleep and how you're going to get back to sleep and the fact that you're up half an hour, an hour, 45 minutes may actually delay you from getting to sleep again because that anxiety will stimulate you into being awake and it's very, very difficult then to fall back asleep. <laughs> If you're awake for more than about 15 minutes, try getting out of bed and try doing a non-stimulating activity. So many people think that if they're awake, they should just lie there and they should watch the clock and see what happens. Um, but actually, you just worry about that more. So if you get up after about 15 minutes, keep the lights low and do something like maybe a bit of reading, a bit of relaxing music, um, or maybe a relaxation technique itself, that can help you get in a frame of mind to go back asleep and help you to start to relax again. So when you feel that you're getting a little bit sleepy and groggy, pop back into bed at that stage and it might help you drop off to sleep then. Postpone your worry or your brainstorming. Um, a good tip is if you find that you're waking up all the time because you're worried about something or because you've just had a great idea or you've just remembered what you have to do at work tomorrow, um, have a bed, have a, a pad beside your bed where you can write these things down and that way you're not worried about having to remember them in the morning. So you just put them on your pad and in the morning they're all there for you to get to. And then try a relaxation technique. Um, so there are many relaxation techniques out there. Um, and, you know, you don't actually have to have any money to get access to them these days. If you can get access to YouTube, there's, there's hundreds of videos on YouTube that will talk you through lots of relaxation techniques. And progressive muscle relaxation technique might not be the one that works for you. Okay, you might find it's useless, that you don't really enjoy it, um, but there are other techniques out there that you might work for you. So experiment them with them a little bit, okay? Play around and see what it is that helps you relax. But the focus of the relaxation technique should be on relaxing. It shouldn't be, well, I'm going to use this relaxation, I'll be asleep now in a minute, because then you're adding a level of anxiety to using the relaxation technique. So if you just focus on relaxing and getting yourself back in a better state, it may actually promote you to sleep. Other treatments. So the first slide here is prescribed medication. Okay, There are lots of prescribed medications out there for sleeping um, to help promote sleep. 
but they're generally addictive okay they shouldn't be used for long-term use if you can avoid it um, and they should never be used without any medical kind of advice on it um, and I'm not a medic myself I'm a nurse so really it's just to put it out there to you that there are other um, treatments available but that you should consult your medical doctor before you take any prescribed medication and if you are taking prescribed medication at the moment it might be looking at the other practical tips that we've given you here tonight and whether or not you're using those and whether or not they could help to promote better sleep with you and you could eventually come off the nighttime medication as well. And the last one is um, herbal remedies. Okay, so the ones that I would recommend are the ones that are kind of non-toxic and they don't interact with other things such as lavender. Okay, lavender is, it helps to promote sleep. It helps to make you feel more relaxed. Chamomile tea is another one, okay? It can help you to get relaxed and to promote sleep. Um, but there are other natural remedies out there such as valerian okay which you hear people using but some of these natural remedies can actually interact with either physical um, problems or medications of some sort that you're taking so if you want to resort to a natural remedy and it's not something like lavender or chamomile tea then it's probably best to consult your doctor before you start taking it along with having any physical or um, medications that you're taking just to ensure that it doesn't interact with those medications and if despite your best efforts, so you've done your diary for two weeks, you've noted where it is that you're going wrong and what are the practical tips that you're getting wrong and you still can't sleep. So if that is still a problem, then you probably need to consult your doctor on it. OK, but if you do your diary for two weeks and you can pinpoint the places where you're going wrong and start to change those maybe not all at once because one change is, uh, is normally enough for us okay so one change at a time and you might find that you don't need all of these practical tips you don't have to be a perfect sleeper or you don't have to have the perfect storm going on to create a um uh sleep habit that's good for you okay um so you might only need one or two or three of those tips and they might help you get a better night's sleep um but if you can't sleep after trying that do go and see your doctor because as we've said it can lead to many physical and mental health problems thank you very much everybody Thank you very much everybody for all the very, very detailed questions. Unfortunately, we're not going to be able to answer all of them, but we're hoping to cover some of the topics that you've brought up with us. So I think we'll start because I think it's important that we cover as many and as many as we can. Do you have any help for restless leg syndrome? Constantly needing to uh, shake legs when going to sleep. I think um, restless leg syndrome is something. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? I'm sure I'm loud enough. <laughs> um, it's something that co I think a lot of people find commonly affecting sleep. And actually, I've experienced a little bit of restless leg syndrome myself, um, which is probably unusual in someone of my age age. You tend to see that it actually occurs around 40, 50 years of age. And there's no real known cause nor cure for restless leg syndrome, and anybody who's affected by it will, will know that. Um, I suppose the only thing that I can speak to is some of the techniques which would help me myself when I'm experiencing restless leg syndrome. So one of those would be actually getting up out of bed at night time and trying to stretch out those restless legs a little bit and just trying to get that real, like it's a real kind of pull to move the legs. So if you can try and stretch them out a little bit, that helps. And another may be actually that progressive muscle relaxation technique, if you focus that in on your legs a little bit, so using the kind of tightening of those leg muscles um, and letting them relax, that might actually help the rest of the side. If that doesn't help, um, it is something that medication can help, okay? Um, probably not long term, but for a short time, if you're going through kind of acute phases of it, you could go down your GP and explain what's going on, and it's well recognized as a syndrome, and they might be able to prescribe you something that can help with that. Thank you, Jared. Can my body adopt to five hours sleep without causing my body problems in the future? I think that this came up in a number of questions. So what I'm going to say is that the recommended number of hours for sleep is somewhere between seven and nine. But like I said throughout the lecture, that's individual. So if you find actually that five hours of sleep is getting you through the night without any difficulties, 
Um, yes, I mean, you're an individual, you might find that that's enough for you. However, if you find that you're having complicating problems, such as maybe your mood, your cognition, your motor performance, um, obesity, diabetes, you know, those links are really only coming to light at the moment, um, then perhaps the five hours isn't enough for you. So, you know, have another look at it, see if you can increase that a little bit. But if you're healthy and you're well, then yes, five hours will be fine. How to switch off my mind after lights out? There were a number of questions that came up about this, okay? Um, and a lot of it is, like, I'm talking about creating your own toolbox. So what works well for you as a person? What are the techniques that you can put in place that help to reduce that worry for you, okay? Um, but also, I'm going to do a plug to Keith's lecture next week, all right? So the focus of Keith's lecture will be on worry and how to manage worry and how to manage that stress, okay? So if you find that that's the one thing that's keeping you up all night, that the thoughts are wearing and wearing around in your mind and you can't get control of them, then Keith will probably have some very handy tips next week to be able to help you get control of that. I wake up many times every night. Is it best to sleep on my side or back for a better sleep? Okay, so, so long as you're kind of properly aligning yourself at night time so that your, you know, like I was talking about, your pillow isn't too high and you're not causing your neck to maybe push to one side. But Sleeping on your side or your back is actually perfectly acceptable. So whichever one of those is comfortable for you. Sleeping on your stomach, however, can actually cause misalignment in your back. So what you've got is your head turned to one side, so it's out of alignment with your spine, okay, which may cause you low-grade pain across the night time. So side and back, fine, but if you can change sleeping on your stomach, that would be better. There were many questions about heat during the night, so we're going to try and cover it with this question. I constantly wake during the night due to hot flushes. The men don't have to worry about that. How do I deal with this? I know it's the menopause, but it's been going on for a number of years. I think there's a couple of handy tips to look at there. So maybe get yourself a little thermometer for your room. Okay? They, they come on a lot of the child, or you know I'm in the early stages of childhood here, but they do come on a lot of the child monitors. You can actually get a petty egg, it's called, and you give you a color for what color is it your room is at. What you actually want to do is set that at a lower temperature so that when the hot flush comes at night time, it maybe isn't enough to actually wake you up at night time. Another handy thing could be to leave a window open during the night. So you might feel as if you're a little cold maybe to begin with, but as the night progresses and those hot flushes come upon you, it won't be enough to actually wake you up. And the last thing that I would suggest is that you have a look at your bedding. So the talk factor in your duvet is how, how much, um, how high is it? And is it too much for when you're experiencing those hot flushes? Maybe downgrade it a little bit, that might help. I am more productive at study in the evening, find it hard to wind down in the evening. How to unwind is one question. Is a melatonin supplement dangerous? Okay, so a couple of questions came up on melatonin. All right, so like I said, that's a natural hormone that's released um, when it's dark to help make you feel sleepy, okay? Um, it's, to my knowledge, it's not dangerous, it's a natural hormone. However, I have no knowledge as to what people may be on in terms of their medication and whether that may interact with anything that they're on or any physical conditions. So what I would say is if you're planning on introducing melatonin and you have a physical condition or you have medications, that you need to consult your doctor before that so that you're not introducing something that would interfere. Um, another question that came up was, you know, whereabouts you might get that. Now, I don't myself, I've never procured it myself, okay, but I imagine some of the health food supplement shops might be able to get that kind of um, supplement for you, okay. If you specifically ask them at the counter, they might be able to source it somewhere for you. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not available in Ireland anymore. Okay. It's actually illegal. <coughs> it's in America. I imported it from the States and it was actually uh, seized by uh, somebody. Okay, well, there you go. I seem to sleep a lot lately, uh, one to two hours during the day, eight hours at night. Is this normal? I exercise, swim, yoga and walk. I think again we're back to the amount of sleep that people actually need. Do you know what I mean? So for some people you may need over the recommended hours of sleep that are suggested for you. Okay. So if you feel fit, healthy, well, it's not interfering with your life, then I, I really don't th think that that's a massive problem for you, okay? However, if you find that you're constantly sleeping, um, that no matter how much you sleep, you're always falling asleep, 
Okay, that could be an indication that there might be something else going on. So I would recommend that you visit your GP and have a discussion about the fact that you're always sleepy and that they can have a look at whether there's anything else going on here. Okay. Is hot milk at bedtime still a valid aim to sleeping? Can anything be added to the milk to increase melatonin levels? So hot milk will work, okay, um, however, it's best if it's combined with some kind of carbohydrate, okay, which will help. It's the tryptophan that's in the milk that they say promotes sleep, okay. Um, so if you combine hot milk with tryptophan, that, that's in it, and the carbohydrates help to release that. So we might find that helps a little bit. So something like, um, you know, biscuits, Weetabix, um, or bread, those pastas, those kind of carbohydrate benefits might help that. If sleep problems have lasted for decades, despite trying techniques, should one try meds? Yeah, and I think that goes to the, the very last slide of the lecture, which says that if, despite your best efforts, things still aren't getting better for you, then there are, like, there are medication out there to help. What I would just suggest is that you do try and have a look at, despite my best efforts, what are those best efforts? What were they that I was doing to promote the two systems to work best for me, okay? Um, and if you find that you create a little diary and actually you have tried them all, then absolutely go to your GP and if meds are the only option left open to you, then that's something that you need to discuss and decide at an individual level. I absolutely wouldn't put them off the table for people. Will the lecture video be made available to the group here and uh Thank you, the lecture was very useful. Yeah, so that came up in a number of questions, so we just picked one of them. They will, will all the series will be available on the hospital website, okay, and we will use the relaxation technique at the very end. We'll actually put it into an audio clip for people, um, and we'll take off the waking bit at the back of it, um, and it might help them work, and you'll be able to download it from the website itself. Okay. What happens after the five stages of sleep, after the first two hours? Do we remain in stage five, dreaming and rapid eye movement? So I picked that question because I felt that maybe I didn't explain that slide enough to people that there was still a little bit of um, confusion about the five stages of sleep. So we go through these, like through all five stages within 90 to 120 minutes throughout the night. And we will do that four to six times a night. So we, you know, we generally spend about 20% of our time in rapid eye movement sleep at night time and the rest is spent through the other phases of sleep and um, so we don't need to be in that rapid eye movement to get good quality but we do need to move through the whole cycle and depending on how long you sleep about four to six times a night is when you'll get through that so that's why we talk about wakefulness at night being normal because you actually <coughs> find yourself back in stage one okay which is the light sleep so it's what, I mean, it's what you do when you get into that stage or how you manage that stage sometimes that can help you get through the other stages. Thank you, dear. For older, this is wonderful, this is from a lady of 80. For older, non-technical people, what can I get my son to put on my phone? Audio clips on website, white light lamps is the question, where to get it, and is it worth the cost? So in actual fact, having used the white noise for my very young child as well at one point, you can download an app for free, okay, so if you're not used to that technical side of things and you do have somebody is, you just tell them to go onto Google Play and look up um, white noise apps and you'll actually find that there's quite a lot of white noise um, apps there that you can use. Um, and what white noise is, is, is the washing machines, the hair dryers, the fans, it's that kind of low-grade constant noise that goes on in the background. For some people you may find that you need to play it quite high and for other people you just need it to be a small noise in the background. It's not going to help everybody see, but it certainly helps the newborns if that helps anyone else. <laughs> um, and just in relation to other things, YouTube is a great accessory to have on your, your phone. You know, if you can get a loved one to, to put a link to YouTube on for you, and all you have to do then is type into the search bar, you know, and um, relaxation techniques, and plenty of things will come up. And they're all for free, so, I mean, there's no need to be going to spend a lot of money on these kind of things. Um, and off of our own website as well, so we'll have our, this lecture and the relaxation one will be up as well, so you can go on for free from there, and you can get download my lecture if that helps with the relaxation exercise. If re-establishing a healthy, regular sleep pattern, how soon will you notice restoration? 
So all I can do is speak to, to some of the studies that happened here okay, um, in terms of the loss and the impact of loss of sleep. Um, and what they noticed is that after about a week where people return to a regular pattern of sleep, they started to notice some improvements and that steadily increased from there on. So you should, if you can get yourself back into a normal sleep pattern, you should be looking probably at about a week to start seeing slight improvements. And if you can continue that on for a number of weeks, you should see significant improvements then. Thank you, Jira. Uh, this person also asked about the risk, the long-lasting impairment for physical health. Um, I mean, the research in terms of sleep and its impact upon things like diabetes and physical health is kind of in its infancy still as well. So, I mean, we're really only getting to grips. Like, the research about obesity and diabetes is very, very new. It's within the last five to ten years, you know what I mean? So, the long-term effects of that risk remain to be seen. But... All I can say is that the studies that I've read about, they would say that you know people <coughs> notice a change in their physical and mental health if they can get their sleeping patterns back into a regular routine. So hopefully the long-term effects of anything like that are reversed as well. I don't know if you know the answer to this. Is it normal to talk in your sleep like a conversation? <laughs> I have, that's amazing. I have no one to listen to me if I'm talking in my sleep. <laughs> I mean, I mean, lots of people experience that they would talk in their sleep, do you know what I mean? If it's becoming a problem for you, if it's waking you up at night time and you find um, it's you know, difficult to get back a sleep bar to that, then maybe that's something that you need to look at. Perhaps it's to do with using adequate relaxation techniques. Maybe it is to do with your worries and anxieties throughout the day. If, you're, if they're really impacting upon you and you haven't managed to deal with them appropriately, then perhaps they're playing on your mind while you're sleeping and during that active phase are causing you to wake up. Is it normal? I, I think most people at some point in their lives will, will talk during their sleep. But if it's impacting upon your health, then it's not normal. Okay. What is the best way to prevent the mind from becoming active after waking? The yeah, so what we would say is that if you look at creating that toolbox that I was talking about earlier, putting into it a number of things that really help you to relax. So that might be the warm bath before you go to sleep at night, or if you're waking at night time, it might be a particular piece of music that you love to listen to, that you find you always feel relaxed to. If you can have that on standby, that will help you fall off and go back to sleep, even on a short kind of... Um, play on your phone or on a radio where it actually finishes itself, you know. Um, other things are relaxation techniques, like if you practice them enough, you can practice a relaxation technique without needing to hear somebody's voice. So you will know how to get through the steps. So if you create that as part of your toolbox, then what you'll find is that when you wake up, you can use it nearly straight away without having to go off and find something and stimulate yourself um, to being fully awake. So there's no one answer to that for everybody because people are, everybody's an individual, everybody's different and some things work for me that won't work for others and again it's about playing around with, okay well maybe for the next seven nights when I wake up I'll do this particular thing and see if that happens and if that doesn't help, okay well I'll move on to the next thing and if you get through all of those things and they still don't help, you're looking at seeking some kind of help for that. The next question, I think, is answered listening to the radio, if that does help sleep, yes. Are the sleep stages linear from stage 1 to 5, or could one jump from, exam in example, 1 to 2 and then on to 5? No, the sleep stages are linear. Like, how much time you spend in each sleep stage may actually change throughout each cycle of sleep. So, like, it's noted that the further on in the night you get, the more time you spend in REM, REM so that rapid eye movement, whereas the first maybe one to two cycles of sleep, you spend less time in that rapid eye movement um, cycle. But they do, you never get from stage one to stage five. You have to move through them. And that's why we were talking about things like alcohol that might actually affect you getting to stage five. So you might only ever get stages one, two, and three at night time and you might never get as far as stage five okay um which could cause you to feel restless and kind of not rested in the morning if one can remember dreaming i.e having experience in REM sleep can one then feel assured that one has gotten some deep sleep i think 
like dreaming is not a strong indicator of what like it can happen in the other phases of sleep as well. You know what I mean? It most often happens in the REM sleep. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't experience some of it in the lighter phases or in the deeper phases, okay? So really what you want to know is, do I feel rested? Do I feel healthy? Do I feel as if I'm getting enough sleep for my body and for myself? And if you can answer yes to those questions, then you don't need to worry about whether you're in stage one or stage five of sleep, okay? What you know that you're feeling healthy and well and so that sleep isn't a factor that's impinging upon that. An interesting question. How do you banish negative dreams? <laughs> is this the cheese question? <laughs> like, don't you get any items? Yeah, I mean, really, I suppose what sleep does is allow you to process the day's events, and sometimes we process that in funny ways, okay? If negative dreams are a constant factor that are bothering you, you need to seek out to help for that, okay? If it's, if it's something like, I mean, something like stresses or strains from earlier life that are making you wake up because you're revisiting a certain situation, but sometimes it's just the movie we watched on TV, it's just the everyday things that are just being processed slightly differently. So if there's the occasional negative dream that aren't bothering you, then absolutely, like, don't worry about it if it's only occasional. If it's a constant factor um, and you need, you need to seek further help in terms of sleep help, if it's waking you up and you can't go back to sleep. And I think if you look on the website, some of our negative dreams, if you look at the interpretation, they're not negative. They sometimes are something that's very positive, like dreaming of water or dreaming someone that you blast is sometimes a really good sign. So maybe look at dream interpretation. Uh, I'd like to thank, firstly, I'd like to thank you all for participating tonight. You've been all a wonderful audience, and I'd like to thank Cher for all the information that she's given me. I mean, there's things I, I hope I go home tonight and be able to sleep after this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.